Everybody, welcome to System Crappers Live. I'm David Wilson, and we're back again this week with another live stream, which hopefully will not crash and burn horribly this time, um, so that we can get together as a community and talk about whatever interesting topic that I've come up with for the week. And uh, we'll see what we talk about today in just a moment. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, I hope that this stream goes better. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of fluctuation in the bit rate in OBS. It shouldn't be doing that because I changed my whole networking setup since last time, and um, I'm not sure why it's doing this, but let me know in the chat if you see anything weird going on at the same time as the um, uh, stream's going on. Just let me know if it gets choppy or if uh, it starts to buffer, because I would like to know about it. I'm hoping that it doesn't become a problem. Uh, what happened last time is that I changed the layout of how my sort of mesh Wi-Fi network connects to the internet router. And the way that I did it somehow hit like this double NAT problem. And if you've done any network networking before, you, you know what double NAT is, basically where you have two routers that are trying to control the address translation of the devices on the network. So for some reason, uh, the way that I had things wired up caused everything to fail. Uh, network dropouts constantly, all kinds of weird stuff going on. Uh, so that was very frustrating. Uh, the way that I've set it is basically back to the previous configuration, so hopefully it will be fine. We'll see what happens as time goes on here. Uh, let's see. I'd like to say hello to some folks who are here so far. Case, Gun, the Foss Enjoyer, uh, Jeff, uh, Sem. I see you all. Thanks so much for being here. So, um, updates. Hopefully, uh, the only update we need is just that the internet won't uh, crash. Gun says, you'll have to wear a prope 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 propeller beanie to detect the lags. Uh, I hope not. Hey, Fade. Uh, so, first of all, nice, nice that Jeff is here so that uh, you can see this. So, so Jeff will be uh, speaking at the Emacs ATX meetup next Thursday about uh, Crafted Emacs and his work on the Crafted Mastering Emacs module. Basically just giving some of the things that he learned from reading the, the book Mastering Emacs. Um, hopefully that date is right. I got this off of Emacs News. I didn't know that Jeff was doing this, so I just sort of pulled this up as a thing to, to talk about. So uh, definitely go check that out if you're interested in seeing Jeff talk about uh, Crafted Emacs. Uh, should be pretty cool. I'll see if I can check that out as well. Hey, Matt, do you nice to see you? Uh, let's see. Also, hello to GK Pseudo. Nice to see you too. And Colin. Um, also, uh, I'll be talking about some game development stuff again. Uh, next week is the yearly GitHub Game Off competition. Um, it's like a month-long game jam, which should be a lot of fun because I'll have a lot more time to work on a single small game project, uh, not in a weekend like I've been doing the last couple times with the uh, Let em Dare game jams, but this time it's a bit longer. So let's see what we can do with that. Uh, if you're interested in seeing some uh, some hacking with a scheme-derived language, the language mesh that I'm working on, um, building a game from scratch. Definitely check out the Flux Harmonic channel on both YouTube and Twitch. Um, I haven't really announced anything there yet, but I do plan to start streaming occasionally, maybe once or twice a week uh, while I work on that. Uh, I'll probably also be doing updates on uh, my personal Twitter account, uh, twitter.com slash davidwill, and uh, probably like posts on the website. I need to get all that whole thing together, but I've been working on other things this week, so... Uh, oh, wow. Case says Lisp Game Jam just started today. I wish I had known that. I'm seeing some, some hitching in the stream on my uh, my display. That sucks. Anyway. Oh, it's next Wednesday? Okay. So apparently it gave me the wrong date. Let me write this correctly. Wednesday. All right. Is that correct? Uh, November 6th? So anyway, um, 
I think this is going to be a lot of fun. A lot of cool things that I want to do with um, with Mesh and uh, make it another little game. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, one thing that's going to be really interesting this time is that I figured out how to... November 2nd? How did I get that wrong? I think the website told me wrong. November 2nd. My mistake. Sorry about that. Two. There we are. So, um, what was I saying? Ah, yes. So one thing I'm, I've figured out which I haven't fully completed yet, is how to get games written with Mesh to compile to run in the browser. So in this game jam, it will be the first time that you should actually be able to try the game while I'm working on it. So that should be pretty, pretty fun. Uh, hello to uh, Ilya and to Emmanuel. Nice to see you both. Okay. Uh, lastly, I would like to mention once more that uh, the author of Mastering Emacs, uh, Mickey, Mickey Peterson, has done a really cool thing where he has um, given us another way to support the channel. Uh, if you uh, are interested in learning much more deeply about Emacs, check out the book Mastering Emacs. Um, really excellent book. Uh, a few people here in the community have got it and said that it's really good. I've also uh, bought it a long time ago and read it. Um, so if you want to support the channel, uh, check out this link here. Uh, it's an affiliate link with uh, the slash r slash system crackers at the end. If you buy with that link, um, it will a portion of the proceeds will go to supporting the channel, which is really cool. So uh, thank you to all of you who have done that so far. And um, uh, the one thing that I mention every time in case it reminded me of last time is that uh, the the book gets updated every major Emacs release. So anytime you know things have changed in Emacs, or maybe an interesting new feature gets added, uh, the book will be updated to reflect that. So it's a very good uh, living resource for uh, things related to Emacs. So definitely worth checking out, I think. Um, someone asked, I think, uh, doesn't mention system crackers in the bill. I'm not sure. So I think Gunn asked if I was going to continue with the discussion for last week. Yeah, um, probably not. I mean, I should talk about that again, but uh, I, I'm kind of like <laughs> sour on the topic right now just because this stream went to hell while that happens. So I decided to do something different this week. Okay. So uh, today, what I'd actually like to do is uh, start a new project that we can live code on the streams. Uh, so I've been saying for a long time that I want to simplify my personal configuration or my dot files and eliminate the literate style org files that generate my entire configuration. We'll talk about why in just a moment. Um, but even though I want to get rid of the org files, I still want to be able to produce a really nice looking site for my configuration files, which also documents them so that a person can go look at the site and get sort of a commentary about why I set things up a certain way, maybe links to other resources, etc. So I would like to still have the nice output on the site like I have with my current org website or org based site and org based configuration, but uh, with a plain co code based configuration. So for the next few streams, what I'd like to do is focus on building uh, a site generator generator with Emacs that I can finally that can use to finally get my entire configuration up to date on my config site, which is config.davidwill.com. And let's just uh, hop over there really quick so you can see what that looks like. So um, this is looks basically like systemcrappers.net, but it's just a site that gets generated from all my configuration files. You can go over to the Emacs uh, page to look at my Emacs config and. I have a lot of you know organization here and description about all the different parts of my config. Probably not a big surprise. A lot of people have you know got sites like these, and you've probably seen many of them. Maybe even you have one yourself. So what I would like to do is have a site like this, uh, but without having to use org mode files to write all of my configuration. Uh, Case is laughing at my use of the word uh, Nirvana. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is not necessarily. It, well, okay, so th this is an idea I've had for a while because I did streams maybe like a little over a year ago, maybe longer than that. I don't even remember how long ago it was. Uh, talking about reverse literate configurations where you start from just a code based configuration and then you can generate a site from it. So I'm sort of going back to that idea because I never really got over the idea, but I never thought of a good way to do it up until now. But uh, a viewer of the channel, um, uh, Migrev Dolzeg, not sure about the name, but that's the way it's, it's written. Uh, has come up with a package called Hawk, which I think is pretty interesting. If you check out the page for that, it's basically a package for generating a website from a uh, text files and code based configuration, or even from a, a package like a uh, an Emacs uh, package. 
So if you check out the code here or the site here, basically you see you know documentation, documentation site that's generated from the code. So because uh, he sent me a link to his package or they sent me a link to their package, um, I sort of got inspired to see how I might approach the same thing because I have a few different things in mind that I would try to use to make this happen. Um, I'll probably cover this package at another time because I think it's pretty interesting and there's some really good ideas in here. But um, I thought it might be interesting for us as a community to sort of see how we might write one like this. Uh, Aru says, but what's the problem with org files? Hawk reminds me of ASCII docs. All right. So, um, well, let's just talk about the why first. Maybe, maybe I'll just move this little why section up ahead. So, um, why drop org base config? So, I've been saying for a while that I'm kind of tired of having to tangle out my configuration files every time I sync my configuration between machines. Because I use the same configuration on multiple machines, it becomes a bit of a headache to um, keep everything up to date because I'm making my main configuration edits in org files and then I have to commit those. And then when I get to another machine, I have to sync everything down. But before I can actually use the configuration, I have to retangle it. I have to deal with like merge conflicts in, in files. It's kind of a headache in my opinion. So I want to take out one level of um, abstraction in a sense and just have it be raw configuration files uh, written in code. Um, and that's not the only reason. Uh, what I, I would actually like to do is to, to use Geek's Home a lot more than I'm doing right now to have my configuration be more just like scheme code rather than other various different configuration files. So uh, there's a couple different reasons why I'm sort of heading in this direction. I think that Geek's Home is a much more mm, flexible and appropriate system for uh, having a configuration that gets shared across multiple machines. And I would like to contribute more to Geek's Home, you know, contributing home uh, service definitions and you know documentation and uh, making videos about it and whatnot. So to do that, I need to use it more. And using Org Babel for configuration and Geek's Home at the same time kind of conflicts a little bit, in my opinion. So I'd rather just use uh, Geek's Home for this. Um, and then also another uh, question you might ask is why would you not just use a normal repo website like GitHub or SourceHut? Meaning um why not just have my github.com slash david will slash dot file site be my main configuration site and the idea there is that yeah sure you could do that and it's totally fine to do that but i would sort of like to have more control over how everything is presented on the site that um sort of is the central home for my configuration and also be able to link to other things um and just display it how i would like to do it so it would be pretty uh, fun i think to try to come up with a good way to do it we have some ducks in the chat apparently uh, Xir says, couldn't a Geek's home service be used to tangle uh, config files? Uh, yes. I mean, you could have a Geek's home service that could um, run Emacs and tangle configuration files out. But that seems like, like, in, like a third level of abstraction, which is kind of even more of a headache. So yes, you could do that for sure. But I don't really want to try it myself. So uh, GK Sudo asked, did you manage to uh, reverse org babel tangle your init in the end? Yeah, no. I mean, I suppose we could do it, but. Uh, um, somebody was telling me, I can't remember who it was. It was a while back. Telling me about basically um, there is a reverse tangling option with org babel where you can suck code back into an org file from individual files. But I don't know. It's, it's just more of the same problem in my opinion. Uh, Benoit says you would lose the tooling benefits of using Scheme in the REPL. Definitely. Okay. So um, now let's talk about the features that I actually want from this. Uh, these are not in any specific order. It's just sort of the order that I, th I thought of them whenever I was writing up the uh, show notes. Um, I would like to use the same syntax highlighting as I do in my configuration or at least use a specific uh, Emacs theme. So basically the theme that I'm using right now, if I were to go to my, let's see, is it going to load? There it is. Well, let's open up uh, .emacs and .el. So the, the same theme that you see here, I would like to have the website generate with, which totally doable. It's just a thing that I want to do as a part of the site. So either this theme that I'm using right now or just anything that I would choose basically. Uh, that way I have a site that looks like my Emacs configuration more or less. 
uh, linkable line numbers would be nice so that if I wanted to send someone a link to a part of my configuration, I would be able to do that. So each line in the config should be able to have like a link for the line number to click on it and then have like an anchor to send to someone. Um, doing line ranges like you can do on GitHub would also be nice, but uh, we won't get there just yet, maybe later. Uh, possibly generate permalink folders for old older commits. So one thing you can do on GitHub or SourceHut or any other repository-based website is you can look at previous commits uh, for a com configuration. So it might be nice if you could have like a permalink to where you can always go back to a specific version of the configuration that's on the config website, but it's sort of overkill. So it's not really a super huge priority for me, but it's something that I might be interested to try if we uh, make progress on some of the other things over the next few streams. Uh, some basic method of formatting the contents of the comments in code files, including uh, links to other files. And this is one thing that sort of um, I was inspired by from, uh, from Hawk, because the idea is that uh, you can use something that's almost like um, Gemini syntax. So Hawk has this ability to do links, which are basically like how you do links in Gemini, and also headings as well with... Uh, with hash marks. Oh no, sorry, with equal signs. So, you know, this is kind of a good idea, I think, because then you can do some basic uh, formatting inside of your uh, text and then have it do things when it gets rendered to HTML. Uh, also, you can have links like, uh, whoa, in your header and footer. I don't know how I just did that. Let's drop that back here. Hey, let's go back right here. Thank you. All right. Um, but this is actually written by hand. I don't think this is generated. I think this is actually part of the source file. So um, it'd be nice to have these things generated by default, not necessarily mm, have to hand write it every time you want it somewhere. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, basic file tree pages and header footer for navigation. So uh, you should be able to look at a file tree of the stuff in the configuration to navigate around as you want to. And each page that has uh, the code for a particular configuration file should have some kind of navigation bar that says sort of where you are in the file hierarchy. So you can jump back up to a higher level and sort of understand the context of where you are in the uh, dot .files folder. Um, maybe you could uh, extract defined function names to generate a table of contents at the top. So maybe if you have a bunch of functions defined, you could have a table of contents at the top so you could jump down into various different sections or maybe even extracting the headings that are in the contents or sorry, in the comments and make a, a table of contents out of those so that someone could easily jump to different sections. That might be pretty useful. So um, right, function names uh, or uh, comment headings. And lastly, it should also be good for generating literate documentation sites for code projects. So for instance, I would like to have a site for the mesh code base where you can actually go look at the code for Mesh, but also see the sort of documentation comments around everything. So if you want to learn more about the project, maybe learn how to contribute to it, you can go look at the site that basically is just the annotated code uh, for that. So uh, that should be pretty fun if we could make that work too. So the plan, I've been thinking about this a little bit and there's a few different things we might try to make this work. Uh, so first of all, uh, there's a few different ways that you can, in Emacs, some that are external packages, some things that are built in that allow you to generate an HTML page from the contents of a buffer and also to have those contents be um, colorized based on the theme that's being used or the faces that are being used in the buffer. Uh, one of those that is I've used before is HTMLize. Another one is called HTML Fontify, which actually comes with Emacs, I believe. So we can try using one of those to see what kind of output we get and then uh, go from there to try to massage it a little bit to turn it into a site that we would want to use. Uh, there's also built-in functionality in Emacs from the dom.el package that allows you to manipulate um, HTML contents, basically the XML structure of an HTML document. I haven't really used it at all, so we're sort of going to figure it out as we go through this. But the idea would be to uh, generate the HTML page for a code file, then use dom.el uh, to extract the body of that page. And then we could use the ESXML package to uh, use Emacs Lisp to generate an HTML template to wrap around that to make it to the various different pages. And then possibly use a normal org export to export any .org files, which might be in the folders since they might be like readme files or maybe other documentation files that need to be displayed in a more uh, normal 
uh, doc, sort of mm, document style, I suppose. So we could use normal org export to export that out and then maybe use some of this other code to uh, put it into a template. Obviously that so, sort of sidesteps the org publishing system, but maybe that's the right thing to do. I don't know. This is a very special purpose package, so we don't necessarily need to use you know the um, entire org publishing system publishing system we'll see i don't know maybe maybe it will work maybe it won't work i don't know i don't know how to do it how well it will work uh and also for a name for the project since i am, intend to put this in a repo and use it and maybe other people might use it uh help me come up with a name i don't know i was thinking of things like let's see uh config weaver because you know like back in the 90s there was a program called dreamweaver for making uh, websites so this could be config weaver or uh oh. Uh, K says, just take screenshots of your config. No, we're not doing that. Uh, what else can we think of for a name for this? Um, I also thought of something like uh, dot weaver or dot vanity. But, you know, this all sort of implies it's for configuration sites. It could just be for, you know, any code. Let me go see what people have been saying in the chat. Um, Elias says, uh, just use sync folder between uh, machines. I use Dropbox. Yeah, you could do that, but I like using a Git repo for these things. Jeff says, literate configs are overrated. All the text you type could easily be comments in the actual code rather than incurring the complexity of tangling stuff. Uh, that said, I still use org mode with verb for my postman replacement. No tangling there, though. Yeah, I don't know. That, literate configs... Um... I've, I've grown to not be so fond of them over time. Gun says, I have my complete doc files under git control using an alias. Uh, different hosts go on different branches. That's, that, that could be a good idea for, for sure. Ilya says, I agree about literate coding is a bad idea. Hello to Anakit. And Kay says, uh, actually, weaving is related to tangling, so it's not bad. Yeah. Dot weaver is greater than config weaver. Yeah, it has more of a ring to it. Uh, the opposite of tangle, weave for the dock. Uh-huh. Okay, so weave is not too bad as a word. My thesaurus machine says valley. Okay, or filigree. What is filigree? Obviously, I don't, I'm not up on my fancy words. Elias says, sync folder does, has, does not eliminate git repo. Yeah, you, that's true. That's true. All right, so maybe we can just go with uh, Dot Weaver for now, and then maybe if someone has a better idea, better idea. Anika, we discussed that a little bit earlier, so whenever you watch the replay of the stream, you could check it out. Okay, so let's just get it started. Um, I'm gonna go and create a folder for Dot Weaver and Dot Weaver El. Save it. Create the folder. Okay. Case says, filigree is like gold leaf or something. Maybe. Uh, provide uh, dot weaver. I need to put a little single quote there. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Defund dot weaver. Um, publish. Not publish. Generate site. We're gonna do something really, really basic for now. Input path, output path, not gonna to be too fancy. All right. And uh, catch me whenever I use scheme syntax for defining functions, because it's gonna happen really often. <laughs> Case is having trouble uh, pasting things into the chat. That's okay. All right, so um, we can start basically how about this? We needed to go like one file at a time. So no, Lispy, don't do that. All right, generate file, uh, input file, and then output path. So the idea would be that um, input file would be something like uh, even this dot weaver dot el, and the output file would be dot weaver dot el dot html. Just something really simple for that. 
So uh, what we could do is use something like this HTMLify or HTML fontify buffer. All right, so create a new buffer name for the current buffer plus an HTML extension containing an inline CSS style sheet, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Oh, quantify string. Okay, that's better then. Create a new buffer. Wait, HTML, HTML fontify fontify string. Okay, take a string and return a fontified version of it. Assume that the string has text properties that allow it to be fontified. Convenience wrapper around fontify buffer. So I don't want to buffer per se, but I guess it's fine. Optional source dear file. Oh, okay. So what can I, can I just like pass in parameters to uh, source dear? If source dear and file arguments are set, look up e tags derived entries. What? That doesn't make any sense. Ah, okay. So it enables hyperlinking. What is that? HFY tags cache, an A list of the form. Each tag hash entry then contains entries of the form tag string to. I'm not sure what that means, unless it's for like adding tags in the code that can um, generate links. Yeah, I know. Definitely uh, with temp buffer and whatnot. So those are not for picking things up. So let's just try. The thing I don't like is it creates another buffer and it pops to the buffer. I don't want it to do that. HFY fontify buffer, fontify buffer. There's interactive functions. Pair e tags map for it. What does e tags mean in this case? Exuberant c tags or emacs e tags. Ah, uh, okay. So it's linking between um, symbols in the code. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got some, you know. Nice little joke comments in here. So then what else? Uh, HTML fontify. What is the RGB file? Load RGB file. So maybe it has its own CSS uh, theming thing. Someone asked, could you please play with commercial Emacs ne next stream? Uh, I mean, there's there's not, not a whole lot different about commercial Emacs, is there? I'm wondering if the output of this is not very good. Let's just try this. Uh, HTML fontify buffer. Let's see what it gives us for this. I mean, uh, it's already doing the HTML thing by default, which is not so bad. I just don't want it to pop the buffer. Okay, so we got CSS here. Uh, okay, it's using my font. It might actually be doing the right thing. Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna use um, HTBD serve directory and then localhost 8080. Uh, let me go to .weaver.el.html. Oh, come on now. What don't you like? Oh, did I put... Uh, maybe I did it in the wrong place. Oh. Oh, is it because it's not saved? Okay. Fine. Reload the page.
Maybe I need to do that. Okay, there we go. Wow, that's huge. And the font doesn't show up because uh, it needs to be put in, but that's a starting point. Um, this is a package, I think. So the, the function that I'm using, which is really useful actually, is uh, HTTP, what is it? HTTP, no, serve. HTTPD serve directory, and that comes from the simple HTTPD package. Very good. All right, so we got some output here. It's very big. The font size should be smaller, but it does accomplish the goal of having the uh, theme, which is kind of nice. And this is a built-in package. This is uh, the HTML Fontify package that's built into, into Emacs. So in theory, you could run this as a script and you could have um, the init.el that you want, like sort of a, a minimal init.el that loads the font, sets the size correctly, and then uh, sets the theme, and then you could have it generate this out for the near side. Yes, we need macros. Macros. So uh, it's nice that it has all this. The CSS style names are interesting. Ah, okay, they're just based on the face names, looks like. That's fine. What is all this? As class and in Internet Explorer. How old is that? Wow. Got a bunch of JavaScript baked in. I don't know if there's a way to turn that off. That's okay for now. Okay. So let's see. How would I want to proceed with making this work a little bit better? Uh, for the font... You kind of need a way to pull in the right font for this. And the way that I do that on uh, systemcovers.net is just, in, wow, why did it do that? Get out of here. Uh, inspect. Going to, ah, it's going ahead. So I'm pulling in fonts from uh, CSS files. And then on a page, like, uh, oh, even right here is fine. So let me just pull this, inspect this block. O class Emacs Lisp. Uh, how am I even lining those up? Site. Come on, you can't navigate to. Okay, whoops, free. No? Pre code, JetBrains Mono. Okay, so it is possible to, to do that. Shouldn't the font family be quoted? Uh, in theory, yes. I don't know why it's not uh, quoting it uh, for me in that case. Kind of weird. But we'll see if it ends up being a problem. Um, what can I do in the meantime? Let's, let's uh, think about this for a minute. Uh, the first thing we could do is try to massage the code a little bit. So we want to use this dom.el library. If I were to go back to .weaver, so what we what we ran was um, HTML fontify buffer, right? But we needed to be like in with uh, temp buffer. And what is the documentation for that? So not really temp buffer. I need, there's like a with file buffer or something. With temp. Create a new buffer, no. Temp file, no. I guess uh, if I insert the contents of a file. With current buffer, I suppose I could do that. If I, um, yes, th please don't uh, invoke the, the networking gods because uh, there, there are variances in the bit rate going out right now. So anything could happen. Hmm.
All right, so uh, it's been a little while since I've written some Emacs lists, so we're gonna have to think about this for a minute. So like, I think we need save excursion, right? Save excursion, is that uh, something where I have to write stuff inside of it? Okay, so I have a body. So I wanna save excursion, because I need to uh, go to a particular file. So um, find file, I think no select is wrong, right? Because we need it to set the current buffer. Read current file name into a buffer and return the buffer. I could do um, with current buffer, right? Without selecting it. So with current buffer, buffer or name. Okay, find file, no select. Input, input file. Also, there could be like defund.weaver generate current buffer, which could do some of this work. Ah, uh, yeah, Case had the same idea. So uh, with current buffer, we'll get rid of this part right here. And then we could do the HTML fontify buffer bit. That could be enough to get it going. So maybe if I um, take this dot weaver generate current buffer. Okay. To do more stuff. So if I eval buffer here, so generate file, okay. Oh, I also need to make this interactive. Okay. So in this case, I can do um, dot weaver generate current buffer. Why did it not work? Let's re reload this and see what it does. So it did not regenerate it. I wonder if I need to call that function interactively. Hmm. Shouldn't have to do this, right? Apparently I do. Okay, that's fine. I can close that, reload this. Okay, so, whoa, why don't we have the uh, XML thing at the top? That's funny. I think I must have just deleted that character by accident. Okay. So that's a little bit of progress here. Another thing that might be, what did I do? Might be nice to do is uh, maybe even before generating, I could sort of tweak the font settings and whatnot, but we won't worry about that just yet. So we've got this file. I don't want that thing to show up, but maybe what I need is to do save excursion, excursion here as well. And maybe take it out here because the uh, dot weaver thing should take care of that. I just don't want it to pop up that buffer. So if I do that, then I run, oh, I didn't go back. So, save excursion. Save the point and the current buffer, execute body, and then restore those things. Maybe it's just this whole um, nested bit. Can't be right though, can it? I'm not even, not even calling this yet, so. Here, let's see. Yeah, it sort of forces it. Uh, H, F, Y, can I just turn that behavior off? Let's see. HTML fontify buffer. Um, so switch to buffer. Called interactively. Display the buffer in interactive mode. Now, that's weird. Obviously, that's why this is happening. So, switch the buffer. Okay, it's the same thing. So, it should be updating the output. Let's just not call it interactively then, in that case. Go back to this. Take out. So, let's make sure. We have call, interactive, call interactively right there. Let's just take out the call interactively part. Drop it to that. 
don't really need to do save excursion here. So if I were to run this function again, it doesn't pop anything up, but the output did not change, which is very strange to me. I just don't get why. So if not file, prog and secu file buffer file name. Uh, let's see, trace function. Let's do that. Hmm. So it, it it is getting called. Okay, thank you, bye. You're the cache. Um, maybe, let's see. I think, um, yeah, uh, this should be clearing the cache automatically. Let's check that. Uh, settings. Um, where is the cache thing? Ah, uh, disable HTTP cache and toolbox is open. Nah, it still doesn't work. I do this. It creates a buffer. Ah. Okay. And it returns the buffer, which is fine. I see. Okay. So it's creating a buffer and returning it. So what I need to do is get the contents of that buffer and write it out to a file. Or maybe just save buffer, right? Save buffer. What is it? Um... Save buffer, save current buffer. So with current buffer, save buffer. This should do it, I think. So if I were to do uh, dot we regenerate current buffer, go back here, reload this. Ah. Huh. Message. Uh, what is it? Um, current buffer? No. Current file name? No. Buffer name. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Still not writing it out though. Control Shift R. Yeah, still writing out the wrong thing. And in fact, we could probably just go look at the file and see if the timestamp is up to date. Yeah, it's been five minutes ago since that was written out. So we've got it in the right place. Question is, um, what's the file path? Buffer file. I forgot the function. Oh. Turn the name of the file buffer file name okay that's right buffer file name okay it should be writing it out right write buffer hmm wonder why it doesn't do anything let's go to that buffer uh, dot weaver dot el it seems to be saved so um call interactively yeah Maybe this is a cache issue after all. Write file. Write current buffer into file file name. Mm. Actually, somehow it thinks that the buffer hasn't uh, removed save excursion. I don't think it's going to matter, but. We're gonna try it and see what happens. All right, let's do this. Reverting buffer dot weaver. Huh, why did it actually change something then? Do with current buffer, save buffer. Buffer file name is 
weaver.el.html. Okay, so I'm changing things in the file and the output does not get changed. Yeah, I know it's not writing it for some reason. Like it, it thinks that it's not, it doesn't need to be saved. So when I actually change the file myself, it uh, it writes it out. So save buffer thinks. How about this? Uh, file modified. How do I make a file a buffer dirty? Buffer dirty. Modified p. Now let's just try this, right? File. Uh, file name, confirm. Buffer file name. Let's just do this instead. How about that? All right. Wow, that took a moment. But it did work. Okay, so it's working now. Set buffer modify P, really? Mark current buffer is modified or unmodified according to flag. Probably better not to. Well, let's let's go with this approach. Because I think um write file. Confirm. Uh, we want confirm to be false. I don't want it to confirm anything. Confirm. It's not nil. This function asks for confirmation before overriding existing file. I want it to do it every time. Okay. All right. So the more stuff here needs to be processing the file. So we can start doing a little bit of that. Also, this dot we regenerate file giving being given an input file and an output path. I mean, we don't really need to do that, in fact, because we could just use the current buffer approach. And then um, when we're looping over the files inside the folder, we could just do with current buffer on all these. So that should be enough, I think. And with, with current buffer, doesn't actually change the user's visible buffer. So it's good enough, I believe. All right, so in this case, let's see what we can do with uh, dom.el. So find library dom. All right, so dom tag, Where, what's like the entry point to this thing? There's probably like a manual for this as well. Remove attribute, dom text, dom by tag, strings. Go to the bottom. Dom print, we might need that later. Pretty print, I see, so. Node. Okay, so Emacs Dom. Lib XML parse HTML region. Okay. Let's see. Lib XML uh, parse HTML region. All right. Parse the region as an HTML document. Do I need to set start and end, or is this an interactive? So let's go into this file and say lib XML parse HTML region uh, point min point max. Okay, so let's see. I think that's good. I mean, it seems to be the contents as we would want to see them. All right, a lot of stuff, spans, but they don't really give me any of the extra information. Um, let's see, span with, yeah, so we've got like this comment delimiter with a class. 
but I don't see any of the information being uh, put in here, which is kind of weird. Um, Cause I need the class information in case I want to actually manipulate it. But I know now what to do, at least in the code, I can go here and inside the current buffer, I can use uh, lib XML. In fact, I want to probably just do a little let here. Uh, let um, document, um, no, just grab this little bit here. Probably need to set some variable. Yeah, yeah, probably so. All right, so lib XML uh, parse HTML region point min uh, point max. Let's clean this up a little bit. So it's not so ugly. Are these ellipses or some sort of dotted pairs in Lisp? I don't know. Good question. Maybe it's just not printing those out. Like it's got stuff in there, maybe. Okay, so we got document. And now inside of that, we can uh, mess around with it a little bit. So maybe I do want to switch the buffer for now. So switch to buffer current buffer. And just see if we can do anything here. So DOM node. DOM returned, child nodes are either strings or DOM objects. Seem to be attributes here. Okay, so it should have uh, an A list for the attributes. DOM children. Okay, remove, DOM remove. Cool. So let's say we wanted to remove something specific. I just, you know, out of curiosity, let's see what we can do to remove something from the DOM. Uh, if we go back to the HTML file, maybe I want to remove um, this meta right here, just to give it a shot. So if, can I find a particular node? Uh, let's see. DOM by tag. We'll return all nodes that are of type tag. Uh, let's see, DOM by ID. So meta name. DOM search. Return all nodes in DOM where predicate returns a non-nil value. Great, we got some more spam going on here. Fantastic. Josh says, uh, is there a good practical use for Lisp out there besides Emacs? I mean, it's just a general programming language. I write games in uh, Scheme. I wonder how it removes the node. It would have to uniquely identify each one of them. So first of all, Let's try to uh, Dom children. Let's just make this doc so we don't have to type too much stuff. Dom children of node, which I'm guessing the, that should be fine. Return the tag. Is this a, can I just do like car on this list? If it's a list. And then Dom uh, tag. Message. Try that out. And then we can just run this again. And also take a look at first node head. Okay, is that correct? Uh, no. Ah, okay, so it's it's only pulling up HTML, I'm guessing. So what about the root? If I were to just take all this part right here out, then what's it tell me?
Can't be right. Come on. Uh, first node head. It still doesn't make any sense because Dom children. Oh, duh. Okay, HTML. So it's just the root of everything. Hey, Jafer. Okay, so that gives us the ability to look at um, what we're trying to find. So if I use the Dom search, Dom predicate. Let's try this. Dom search. And let me take a look at the docs for this. So it's Dom and predicate. So I'm going to put in uh, doc and then Lambda um, with a node. So node uh, string equal uh, Dom tag node meta. 